Thinking complements the sense perceptions, completes them with their essence. That requires a thinking appropriate to the object it investigates. In other words, every field of phenomena calls for a different kind of thinking. In the inorganic sciences, the law as fundamental phenomenon is decisive. For instance, the longer the pendulum, the more slowly it swings. In the organic sciences, the ether body is involved, the archetype forming the physical organism of a living being. Therefore, not the fundamental phenomenon, but the type is here decisive. The oak type, the lion type, among the mammals, at least, all the group types are obviously related. As Goethe established, the bones correspond without exception, which raises the question of origin. If it is to be considered without presupposition, the question needs to have the following form. Does A come from B? Does B come from A? Or do both share a source? The fossil record shows the physical, or more properly, etheric direction of time. The anthroposophical method is to understand the world by understanding the being of man, and conversely. The human body has a nerve sense organism centered in the head, a rhythmic system centered in the chest, and a system of metabolism and limb movement centered in the lower body. This permits a first survey of evolution. Namely, it proceeds in three main stages, from head to limb. Primitive invertebrates are spherical, then symmetrical in multiple directions. The body is primarily surface. Later, they are polarized into front and rear. The fish has a centralized nervous system, centralized in the head, and the rest of the body is rhythmically permeated by ribs, which sometimes even extend into the fins. But there are still no limbs. Apart from exceptions, the fins do not propel the fish, but balance it. The digestive system is weak, too. The stomach has a simple spindle form. The gut is usually not much longer than the fish. Beginning with amphibians, proper limbs appear with joints. The animal can now move outside of water. In an example of the partial correctness of the biogenetic law, the tadpole is fish-like remaining submerged in water, breathing with gills, lacking limbs, swimming by undulating movements, and even sensing movement and balance with a lateral line. Later animals have more highly developed extremities. Ontogeny, the development of the single organism, recapitulates this as well. Even before birth, a child has a relatively well-developed head and sense organs. The digestive tract and the limbs are slower to develop. A second possible survey, based on the resonance between man and the world, finds a typical process of internalization. 
the most primitive organisms, are moved by the environment. More developed organisms increasingly move themselves. In the various types of skeletons, the solid element is gradually internalized. The fluid element flows in and out of a sponge. In a jellyfish, it is slightly enclosed. Beginning with insects, it is centralized in a heart and becomes more so as evolution progresses toward the vertebrates. Another internalization of the water element is the transformation of the lateral line with which the fish senses the movement of the water flowing through to the semicircular canal as the organ of balance in the inner ear. As for air, in the fish, the organs of breathing, namely the gills, do not form a space of their own inside the trunk, but integrate in complete surrender in the flow of water through the oral cavity. Lungs begin with amphibians. Still later groups take the air all the way into the bone, in the sinuses. Likewise, the element of warmth is internalized, making advanced animals more independent of the temperature of the environment. You could call it involution. Again, reproduction begins in the outer world and is internalized over the course of evolution. For fish and amphibians, the water, air, and warmth of the environment are the embryo's protective sac. The reptile has an amnion and a shell. The bird incubates her eggs. Mammals take embryonic development into the womb. So all in all, autonomy increases. Obviously, ontogeny recapitulates this too. Even thinking is internalized. For Aristotle, concepts were still received from without, along with the sense impressions. Nothing was in the intellect that had not been in the senses. Leibniz, on the other hand, expressed our modern constitution by objecting, nothing is in the intellect that was not in the senses, except concepts. Ontogeny recapitulates the internalization of thinking, too. And as mentioned in the presentation on reincarnation, our higher self still works from the surrounding world. When it is fully internalized, we shall radiate as sun. And now, brace yourselves for some value judgments. There is such a thing as nobility. A discovery by Harold Bloom can help lift it from the realm of purely personal liking into somewhat more objective clarity. He identified a paradoxical phenomenon in which strong art makes its predecessors seem like imitations.
Exhibit A, four-part counterpoint. Every voice with its own independent melody. <laughs> And now the same piece by a different composer. <laughs> Sounds like a decent copy, a simplified version. Yet that was Bach's source for this chorale. Exhibit B. Compare Romeo and Juliet, or indeed any play by Shakespeare, with the version he got the story from. And the illusion arises that the source is but a cheap imitation. Exhibit C. Goethe's Faust, and the moralizing cautionary tale that served him as raw material. Here the impression is of a flimsy parody. In these and other examples, it is possible to see a backward stream of time in which great events are prepared. More strong art. The Madonna in the Clouds. And on the right, the same painting by Raphael's teacher, Perugino. The original appears later. If taken seriously, this idea of backward time revolutionizes the possibilities of understanding evolution. An example from ontogeny is apoptosis, shown here in the embryonic development of the limbs, in which substance breaks down, sculpting, differentiating the hand plate into digits. The result explains the process, that is, the later explains the earlier. Here too, Ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. And now a question to be reconsidered. As a verb, ape even means to imitate. Children today are essentially taught your grandmother was an ape, and your great-grandmother was a sea urchin. 
what began in the 19th century as an academic issue, the blurring of the distinction between man and animal, becomes practical life soon enough. People can be bred and trained. That, too, is an evolution from head to limb, from thought to deed. And it is still happening. The nobility of man is at stake. The theory of evolution is itself currently undergoing evolution. The crucial question remains unanswered. How does a deformation change into the real thing? Reverse the question, and it can be answered. More about that next time. We conclude with a challenging summary, something to think about for the next installments. Into all of this, writes Rudolf Steiner, there played a thought inclination of mine toward the then flourishing theory of evolution. It had in Heckel taken on forms in which the self-sustained existence and working of the spiritual could find no consideration. The later, the perfect, was supposed to have issued from the earlier, the unevolved, in the course of time. That made sense to me with regard to the outer sensory actuality. Yet I knew the self-sustaining spirituality braced in itself, independent of the sensory, too well to say that the outer sensory world of appearance is right. But the bridge needed to be built from this world to that of the spirit. In the course of time, thought in a sensory way, the human spiritual seems to evolve out of the preceding unspiritual. This hints that you could think the course of time another way as well. The evolution of the world is then to be understood like this, that the preceding unspiritual, out of which later the spirituality of man unfolds itself, has next to and outside of it a spiritual. The later spiritualized sensoriness in which man appears then steps onto the scene through this, that the spirit ancestor of man unites with the imperfect unspiritual forms and transforming them then stands forth in sensory form.